Hi, I'm Tom Michaud. I'm a chiropractor just outside of the Boston area. I have been treating elite and recreational athletes for over 40 years. And recently I've made a switch to, now that I'm getting older, to trying to do something about the epidemic of falls. In, in an average year, 40% of people over the age of 70 will fall. That results in 900,000 hospitalizations, 3 million visits to the emergency room, over 300,000 fractured hips. 25% of the people who fracture their hips will be dead in one year, and 50% will be unable to get to their prior level of activity, and that's adjusting for age. It's not just that they fell and they're old. They fell compared to other people their age. They end up not being able to get back to their prior level of activity, and there are things that can be done about it. Uh, several studies, actually, I just finished a paper that has close to 90 studies in it. I reviewed everything ever written on fall prevention, talked to experts all over the world, and came up with a protocol that is designed to assess deficits in balance, strength, flexibility, and foot architecture to determine exactly what predisposes someone to falling. There's a million reasons that people can fall. They can have impaired vision, they can be on medication. First thing I'm going to put up is a table of different med medications that increase your risk of falling. All these factors increase the risk of fall, but the falls, but the vast majority of falls are in just regular people who are just getting old and frail. The percentage of our population that is over the age of 65 is skyrocketing. Right now, we are one in 11 people who are over 65. In the near future, we're going to be one in six. Um, the number of people over 85 is growing even faster. And what's worse, information came out from the CDC that the number of falls that are happening each year is exceeding the population growth of the older generation. So it's not that we're getting older so there's more falls. It's the people who are getting older are less fit and more prone to falling. As I said before, the vast majority of falls can be traced to deficits in strength, balance, flexibility, and foot architecture. So I have made up a, a series of tests that I love, um, 14 easy tests they can be done in office, and they identify your fall risk. And that's important because you just can't do a, a generalized program. It's not a one size fits all. Uh, the intervention has to be geared towards you, so towards your deficit. So I have in this series of tests, Based on how you do, interventions will be done to modify your risk. If you have deficits in balance but not strength, then you'll be doing the balance exercises. The entire protocol, if you do it by itself, lasts about 45 minutes. But if you only have a few deficits, you can do the whole thing in you know, 15 to 20 minutes. So I'm going to review the different tests that I've come up with, that other people have come up with, and give parameters for what's considered um, ideal, often based on your age. So the first test we're going to run through is called the anterior fall envelope. I put a link. This is a laser scanner device. It costs around $50. Um, it's very easy to use. There's two ways of doing this. One is I often have a tripod, but I'm in someone else's office right now. So what I do is there's a little laser spot, which you can see right here. I'm going to point that right at her belt line. And now I've got the laser scanner on her. I press it once. Now you're going to lean forward and go as far as you comfortably can. Keep your spine straight. Keep your hips straight. Keep your head just in that position. And once she reaches, perfect. So once she reaches the anterior, now come back. So the distance that she moved just there gets measured on this. It has two separate numbers. The first time you press it, will record the start. And then when they go to the anterior fall envelope, you press it twice, it records that number. And she just went 4.7 inches, which is perfect. There's a way you could do this at home if you would like. Get one of these scanners, and Carrie, you know how to do this. You're just going to run through that. The measurement is taken at the umbilicus, at the belly button. You just hold the laser scanner 
against your um, belly button, press it once, you'll see the laser point on the wall, then when you press it again and keep your head in neutral, now lean forward as far as you comfortably can. Don't tilt your head forward, get to your balance point, now press it twice once you've reached your anterior fall envelope. So you went 4.7 inches that time. So this is a measure of toe strength. It is really easy to do. You use something called a toe strength dynamometer, and I just want to show you how it works. You just hit the power button, and then when you scroll through that, can you see the numbers in there? Yep. You hit different buttons on the right, and you can go between pounds and kilograms. I like to go with pounds, and then the most important thing is that you see the peak hold in the upper left of this. And once you see that like that, you'll get a strength number that holds the final number. And that final number will tell you what the score um, in pounds beneath the toes is. And you should get 10% of your body weight beneath your big toes, 7% beneath your lesser toes. So to do this test, and again, toe weakness is the number one predictor of falls. You weaken in your feet faster than you weaken in any other part of your body. Quad weakness is not a great predictor of falls. Uh, toe weakness is. So you need to quantify the measurements. So I made this little device, crazy easy to use. We're just going to clear it, go from pounds to kilograms, make sure we're on hold, and we are good to go. And you're going to keep your heel on the ground, your forefoot on the ground. And so heel down, forefoot down. You just take this card, and when you do the big toe, you put the long portion under the big toe. Again, it just takes seconds to do. If someone's really strong, I want to pull it like this. I don't like pulling it like this because it jerks. So I am going to have you keep your heel down, your forefoot down. Now I'm going to pull this out. You stop me by pushing down. Stop me, stop me, stop me, stop me, stop me. She's been doing foot strengthening exercises for a long time. So she got 17.6 pounds. So unless she weighs 180 pounds, you did really well on that test. Um, that's, she's been doing toe pro exercises for two years, so it's good that worked out. Then you press the zero button here again, and it, it goes down to, it resets it at zero. Now you want to check strength beneath the second through fifth. Weakness of the second through fifth predicts hammer toes. It predicts metatarsal stress fractures. You're going to stop me from pulling this out. Stop me, stop me, stop me, stop me, stop me, stop me. And she pulls it out. And so she got 10 pounds with that test, which is also good. You should get 7% of your body weight with that. So a, compared, her gray toe was disproportionately strong compared to her second through fifth, which is not a problem as long as you hit that 7% body weight on your second through fifth. Um, the big toe is the best predictor of falls. So now when you have that weakness, there's different ways of strengthening. Some people historically have used TheraBands. I don't like TheraBands because they put muscles in shortened position. They have shown that when you fire a muscle in a shortened position, you could get almost zero strength gains. But a person named Goldman did a great paper where he showed when the toe muscles were isometrically contracted and exercised in their lengthened positions, you got four times the strength gains. And that's because you have satellite cells on the end of muscle fibers that when they are stressed, when the fibers are separated, they sense that there's something wrong and they say, oh, this was too much work, we're gonna make it stronger. The strength gains are unbelievable. So I made a device called the Toe Pro Exercise Platform. Ooh, I shouldn't have put my weight to that. I'll cut that out. <laughs> She's my wife, so it's okay if I lean. <laughs> so so I, I, I made a device called the Toe Pro Exercise Platform and I'll show you how to use it now. There are two different exercises to strengthen toes. Because so many falls happen at the initiation of gait, I made this device specifically to stop falls at the initiation of gait. I had the bottom skived out here, so it compresses more. So this allows me to duplicate the exact position the Goldman paper was in. So you're gonna put the uh, Toe Pro platform there, and this is an interesting one because it makes you tense your anterior fall envelope. You're going to put your toes right on the edge of that. Now, this is a mistake people often make. They will put their entire foot on this. I want just the, the, the tips of the toes with the forefoot on the ground. 
So now beneath her forefoot or metatarsal heads, it's on the ground, but the tips of the toes are on this where that soft spot is. You see how the foam caves in there? So now to do this test, you're going to bring your hands forward like you're leaning forward, reaching for something. You're going to lean forward for a few seconds, then you're going to come back. And you're going to see if you can go as far as you can with your anterior fall envelope and then use your toes to push back. So I have people do this 20 times, so do this a bunch of times. It's a great warm-up. Each time you do this, you're learning where your fall envelope is, and the toes are being exercised in their lengthened positions, which produces accelerated strength gains. So at the final one, so say make believe we've just done 20, you're going to hold that and see if you can find the limit of your anterior fall envelope without touching the wall. If you touch the wall, it's fine. You're going to hold that for up to 30 seconds if you can do it. And that's a prolonged isometric contraction. Isometric contractions impair circulation, they increase growth hormone, and they accelerate um, muscle hypertrophy or recovery. And remember, you lose 2% muscle mass every year after the age of 50. This exercise alone would stop that muscle mass loss in your feet. Good job. So now you are going to progress to a more aggressive exercise, and you can walk in place a few times if you feel even slightly fatigued. When you first start doing these protocols, you will more than likely cramp at night in the muscles that go to your toes. Flexor hallucis longus runs off the back of the leg and attaches near the fibula up here. You don't even know you have it. Um, but when you start doing this exercise, it's going to be firing possibly for the first time in your life. So you can get cramps, it can be a little bit sore, no big deal, you work through it. I tell people instead of doing three sets of 15 to begin with, um, you can do three sets of 10, just slowly build up to it. But it takes about one to two weeks before you stop feeling um, uh, cr cramping in those muscles. To do the conventional toe pro exercises, you're gonna do what Carrie's doing right now. You're gonna start with your knees straight and your toes as you go up, you're going to roll in onto your big toe. You really want to see that foam compressing down, which she's doing a great job with. Most people don't. So just practice. Once you get the hang of it, you'll see those toes going down. As she goes up, you want to put more pressure on the inner forefoot. That fires a muscle called peroneus longus, which prevents lateral falls. And as you go up, it also fires peroneus brevis. And I'll put all pictures of these muscles up. That prevents you from falling sidewards. So when this is firing, you see this muscle right here? and keep going, Carrie, that's perfect. That's the medial head of the gastroc. The medial head of the gastroc has a more vertical angle of approach, and it's the muscle that keeps you balanced when you're standing still. So if you're really tight in that muscle, you're at an increased risk for fall. A study out of Iran showed that people who stretch this muscle um, for relatively short periods of time, four 60-second stretches, they were less likely to fall. Um, but strength in this muscle is really important. This is how it's isolated. You can target the lateral muscle over here a couple of times, the lateral gastroc, by doing this exercise with your feet pointing in. But Carrie just did a whole bunch of them, so we're going to do one set of 15. Then for the next set, and if you want, you can stop and stretch for a second. And if you're feeling up for it, you can start your, right, your next set right away. Usually people wait around 30 or 40 seconds. You feel okay? The next set is performed with the knees bent a little. Perfect. That allows you to target the deep muscles to gastroc and soleus because gastroc crosses the knee joint. These deep muscles are interesting in that soleus is unusual. It has the unique ability because it, it's just slow twitch muscle fibers. It oxidizes glucose at incredible rates and it helps, it basically acts as a second heart. So when people have low blood pressure, and they have hypoperfusion, they tend to have cognitive declines as they age. And someone did an amazing study where all he had people do was fire their soleus frequently throughout the day, and soleus acted as a, a pump that decreased the rate of cognitive decline by increasing the flow of um, blood to the central to the brain. So firing soleus is good not just for balance and force output. Weakness of the soleus muscle correlates with impaired distance running. The world's fastest marathon runners have the largest soleus muscles. And soleus also is an important protector of the knee. It prevents uh, knee ligament injuries, specifically the anterior cruciate. People who have strong soleus muscles are also um, less likely to tear their ACL. So you just keep doing your... And when you do this, you're going to do four sets of 15, two sets of 15 with the knee straight, 
two sets of 15 with the knees bent. And then when you finish your entire routine, this is the hard part, you're gonna take your hands off the wall and you're gonna try to balance with your heels half of an inch off the ground. So now try to balance there. What I love about this for fall prevention is that it's really difficult to balance regularly, but because the foam is soft, it requires an immediate exaggerated reaction from your toe muscles to protect you from a fall. It's the easiest thing you can possibly do. If you are pressed for time and you don't want to do any of these, just do this one. This exercise in just 60 seconds can strengthen, but more importantly, it teaches the toe muscles how to control your fall. Most people wouldn't be able to do this. She's been doing this for a while, um, and that's great. If you can balance like that for 60 seconds, because as the toes push down, they have to go through a larger range of motion, so they have to fire faster when they feel you losing balance. So this is a great way to trick your central nervous system into firing the toe muscles quicker. So that's amazing. Good job. And you can stretch out. And after you do this whole routine, just march in place a little bit, stretch your calves, um, and then pat yourself on the back. <laughs>
it's really hard for someone to progress like Carrie where you had that kind of strength. But if you can only do two or three, in three months you'll be doing 10 or 11. So don't get frustrated by it. Really easy to do, especially when you strengthen your toes at the same time. This is the sit to stand test. So you're going to, as you were aware of, you're going to cross your arms. And really easy test to do shoes on. You time in seconds how long it takes for them to go a complete sit to stand transition five times. Okay, so you're in that position. You feel stable, you feel comfortable. Yeah. And are you ready? Mm -hmm. One, two, three, go. Beautiful. You did it. You always do more. You did it in <laughs> seven seconds. If you're in your 60s, you should be able to do it in 12 seconds. If you're, I'll put up a list of age adjusted times. If you're in your 80s, you should be able to do it in 15 seconds. That's a measure of quad strength. It, quad strength hasn't correlated that strongly with falls, but it correlates with falls downstairs. And falling down a flight of stairs is disastrous. So I put this in because this is easy to fix. Usually when people get quad weakness, they are told to do squats or other exercises which are difficult, especially if you have knee arthritis. One of my favorite exercises, let me have you stand up. Um, one of my favorite exercises to fix a quad is you don't want to load an arthritic knee. So to do it, someone did a study and they showed a four to six inch lateral step up where you just go like this has amazing amounts of activity in your quad and your hip, but no pressure on the kneecap or the knee. I'll put up a graph and they show that once you went past a certain angle, the knee started to break down. So you'll hold the weight. Let me have you do this. You know how to do lateral step ups, right? Yep. Hold on to a wall for balance. And now you're just gonna raise and lower. I like having the heel raise the ground at the end. So lift that heel up a little more, just like that. So you see how that heel is going up? You get two birds with one stone with that because that fires the cap muscles, fires the inner quad muscle, fires the hip muscle. Easy to do, slight forward bend to the hip, strengthens the quad without loading the kneecap. Great for people with arthritis. I, I love this test, this exercise rather. This test, the next test is the alternate step test. It's a measure of agility. As you get older, your reaction time slow down slightly. They don't have to. If you do not do rapid exercises or sports where you change direction a lot, you become a little bit slower, even if you're strong. So this measures the speed of action. So you have to be able to do eight steps in 10 seconds. So let me have you run through one step. So a step is all the way up, all the way down. So left foot would go up and it ends when the right foot goes down. And to do this test, you have 10 seconds to do this. And to do this, you set the timer for 10 seconds. And are you ready? Mm -hmm. You go. Nine point five seconds. You went past eight Sorry. steps. She does that all the time. So she did eight steps in ten and nine point five seconds. I will put up a chart that shows you what ages. Someone did a study where they looked at all different ages and how fast they could do it. Um, I have people as they go past 75, I give them 12 seconds, which doesn't fit with the literature, but it's what I've seen and I think if you can do it in 12 seconds. Now say, for example, you failed this test. One of my favorite ways to restore that balance is with a metronome test. A couple of papers came out, one in particular, and I'll put that up. It showed that when people exercise to metronomes, it helps to improve reaction times and agility. So you are going to, I like to set the test for the um, metronome to 135, and you can do this with your watch. If any iPhone has a metronome. You set the metronome, you're gonna have each foot hit the ground in time with this. Try to make your feet make noise when you do it. Make it a noise, maybe not so much noise. Now, as you get better, you pass the test. So this was easy. To, to pass the test, it's got you have to be able to do it 192 beats per minute. So as it gets easier, that was easy for you. That's 180, and you're still doing it. So 
I have people do this for um, 30 seconds, and then if they have difficulty, then drop the metronome down. But if it's easy, ramp the metronome up. And um, I'll just put up the length of time you do it, the average time, but ideally you will be able to set a metronome for 192 and time your feet with it. It improves agility markedly. I had just mentioned that 300,000 people fracture their hip every year. 80%, 75 to 80% of hip fractures are the result of sideways falls. When my mom was in her mid 70s, she was Parkinsonian. She had good bone density. She had a sideways fall and fractured her femoral neck, which just changed her life because it is so difficult coming back from that because of the length of time you're um, out of commission. No, I didn't understand why she fractured her hip at the time, but I found an article that came out a year ago because she had good bone density. This researcher looked at evolutionary changes in our femoral neck over the last four million years, and he showed that there's a little glitch in the shape of our femoral neck that improved our ability to walk around on two legs, but made us more prone to fracture, um, hip fractures, specifically of the upper femoral neck. So I'm putting up an illustration right now and what it shows is that if you look at the top picture on the left, that's Lucy from four, three to four million years ago, her femoral neck, if you look at a femur, this is someone's thigh. If you look at four million years ago, because we weren't walking around on two legs that much, the femoral neck was at a 90 degree angle like this, right? And that was good when we were on all fours, but when we went upright, there's a significant bending force that bends the neck up here and bends the neck down here. I always use the example, it's like if you were gonna have a tree fort or build a fort, and if it was a tree branch coming up like this, you wouldn't put it on a branch like this, it would break. You would put it on a branch that was more upright, anything that would give it a little bit more support so it could tolerate the force. Our femoral neck has evolved over the last four million years to become more vertical. That allows for greater transfer of force through the lower portion of the femoral neck, which is why it gets thicker over time. But it left a little weak spot right up here because there are what are called tension and compression, compressive forces. Compressive forces are on the bottom, and it's because the bone gets pushed like this. Tension forces are on the top, and they bend like this. The tension forces shifted down a little, and it left a little weak spot right there that as we get older, independent of whether we have osteoporosis or not, it thins out markedly. So the bottom area, if you look at the top right of that picture, that top right picture in a 60 year old shows that that bone just gets thicker and thicker. And just remember, you are close to a thousand times more likely to break your hip when you're 80, a hundred times more likely to break your hip when you're 60. Humans are the only mammals that break their hips when they fall laterally. And 20-year-olds don't break their hips when they fall laterally. It's that glitch. If all you've done is walk your whole life or been a biped and not really done other exercises, then that weak spot is there. But a researcher found that certain cultures, like in rural China and Gambia, even though the people are osteoporotic, they don't break their hips when they fall laterally, even when they're old. And it's because they've been doing squats and they've been doing manual labor. They've been, do they've been more active. The researcher showed that when you load your hip while the hip is flexed, like example, if you're hiking up a hill or if you're rowing, that puts, that increases tension in a series of muscles that attach right to the weak spot of the femoral neck that pull on that spot and make the bone stronger. It also rotates the neck a little bit and over years, a few years, it makes this bone stronger. They did a simple study on people in their 20s. All they had them do was a series of simple jumps where they went down to the ground, jumped as high as they could. They only did a few a day, five days a week, and after a relatively short period of time, they increased bone density in their femoral neck. The catch to it is someone repeated that study with people who were older in their 60s, and for five years they did squats and all this other stuff, and the people got a little bit more bone density in their femoral neck, but the people in the control group lost 5% of their bone density. So the, the key to that is you have to do exercises when you're young where your hips are flexed. My favorite exercises are um, rowing, biking, jumping, and I put up a series of exercises that I'll show you and we'll review that target those specific muscles that reinforce that portion of the femoral neck. And 
even if you are 75 or 80 years old and you have that weak spot, if you're really thin, you are more likely to break that bone because as the greater trochanter, that's this bone here, hits the ground, the femoral neck bends this way and that area compresses in. If you had increased strength in there, that wouldn't happen. So one thing I want to do with this is try to prevent lateral falls in the first place. And if you've got you know, a parent or someone that you know is in the 80s or 90s, they spe sell special belts that protect the greater trochanter. They're small, they go under your clothes and they distribute the pressure away from the greater trochanter, decreasing the likelihood of a fracture. But I found some great research that said you can prevent lateral falls in general if your hips are strong. So this protocol will review a bunch of hip strengthening exercises and it'll review a bunch of things you can do to decrease um, the risk of a lateral fall. The next test is the hip rotation strain test. There has been no research showing specifically that hip rotator weakness correlates with falls, but hip rotator weakness has been proven to predict ankle injuries in runners. It's been proven to predict ACL knee ligament tears in college soccer players. And the muscles I'm testing right now attach to that weak spot on the femoral neck. So if you're weak there, there's a good chance that you're going to have to start strengthening your hip rotators. Hip Rotator and abductor strength also is important to prevent lateral falls because it protects you from falling sideways. And one of the main goals of this whole program is to prevent lateral falls. The perk of hip rotator strength is that the stronger you get in those muscles, the easier it is to go up and down stairs, the more balance you have. They're just agility muscles. And most importantly, they attach to that weak spot on the femoral neck, so I love strengthening them. So to do it, you'll use that toe strength dynamometer. I just swap out an ankle cuff on it. Um, and you set it, make sure it's on pounds and peak. I'll go over that one more time later. And this is the easiest test to do. And the Journal of Orthopedic and Sports Physical Therapy just a few days ago came out with a study showing that this has an extremely high integrated reliability. It's a very reliable study. And the numbers are reproducible. You could do them four months apart and tell if someone's doing the strengthening exercises. I'll go over the specific strengthening exercises I like because there's just a few that fix this. And remember, there was a study of Division I uh, college athletes, and it's interesting, a lot of the tests that I'm doing and a lot of the exercise interventions aren't for old people. Most of them have been designed for college-level athletes because just most people over 50 want to have speed and agility. College athletes, especially soccer players, multi-directional sports, they really want speed and agility. So uh, D1 soccer players who didn't generate 20% of their body weight were seven times more likely to tear their anterior cruciate ligament that season. And no one does this test. Highly reliable. Put that strap there. If someone's going to be strong, and I have a feeling you're going to be strong, I anchor it outside my leg just so that I don't have to fight them. You're going to take this ankle. You're going to pull it towards this ankle. Pull in as hard as you can. Harder, 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 harder and relax. I always say harder, harder, harder three times because people don't um, respond to it. So I give them three times to see how high they can get, pull in, harder, 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 and relax. So she's got 18 the first time, 16 the second time. Um, you've got to be 20% of your body weight. So Carrie failed this test. So you're going to have to do hip rotator strengthening exercises. <laughs> and uh, they're so really easy to do and you hadn't been doing them for a while. <laughs> That's what I love about these tests. You can tell who's doing their exercises. I always see her doing her toe pro, so that's why she scored 17 pounds. But this, I haven't seen you do the, the curtsy one. In fact, you started doing them to test things out and were complaining that you were cramping those muscles. So that's how you do that test. It takes two seconds to do. And now the exercise, we're gonna go over how to fix that when you're low. For hip strengthening, one of my favorite ways to target the hip rotator and the back of the hip abductor is with a curtsy step up. So you'll hold a light weight, five or 10 pounds, or if you're really strong, you do a 40 or 50 pounds, but usually five or 10 is fine. And then you're just gonna put one leg up, that's the leg being exercised, and I, you can tell she hasn't been doing them. So, 
<laughs> we just practiced this. Put that leg up. This is why you scored so poorly. So now do the exercise just to get used. There you go. <laughs> That's it. This is the exercise she has not been doing, which is why she scored only 14% body weight. So the key to this is to get that leg to come down like that. That fires the hip rotator in through here and the back edge of the hip abductor. And a little bit of a forward bend in the body as you do it. If you're not used to exercising, and if you can afford it, hire a trainer to go over these exercises with you. Because form is really important, and it's hard to figure these things out on your own. And um, they just help you in a lot of other ways. The, the exercises I'm going over in this routine are, are like good to start with. But as you get stronger, you're going to start enjoying this, and you'll want to do uh, more aggressive strength training. But this routine is going to be good to markedly reduce your fall risk and improve agility. So that's perfect, just like that. And you can just do three sets of 15 repetitions with this. You should be fatigued when you finished. If you're not finished, you need, are you fatigued? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you need to have a heavier weight. So as long as you're fatigued, and then you can stop. <laughs> you can march in place when you do this afterwards because your hips really tighten. Um, and then there are several other hip rotator exercises that I like, which I'll go through now. And then you want that foot to go as far out as you can so that when you do this, you're balanced and your knee isn't going to be bending too far. And then you keep your feet still as you do this. You just do a reach like this. And as you get stronger, you reach forward more. And if you start to lose balance, let go of it. Do it near a wall. Perfect. Hold that for two seconds and go back. Go back. Perfect. Take your lead foot and put it farther in front of you now. Perfect. And now a couple like that. And now one more time, go even farther forward with that lead foot. Now that's perfect. Slowly hold it. Come back. Slowly hold it. Come back. Three sets of 15 repetitions. You set the resistance by how far you lean forward. If that's as far as you can go, that's fine. So come back. But as you get stronger, you'll be able to push that out farther. This really strengthens the back of the hip, and it's great for balance because your feet are close together. So three sets of 15 repetitions. I've been using a five-pound rubber ball with most people, but it's whatever you feel comfortable with. I do recommend rubber because you, you can lose your balance when you do this. It's harder than it looks. The last exercise is something called the DNS core exercise, dynamic neuromuscular stabilization. Brett Winchester, a chiropractor in St. Louis, teaches courses on this all the time. It's usually used, it's a core exercise typically used with elite athletes. He treats a lot of professional baseball players. I like it because it is great for treating a condition what's called long eyes. When people fall, they have to get up and it's surprisingly difficult to get up if you have a weak core. And one study found it was 123 people. They studied them. If they fell to the ground and weren't able to get up in one hour, um, half of them were dead in a year. And they are called long lies. And recent research has shown, in fact, most hospital, most ambulance calls to homes after falls, it's not because they've been injured. It's because they can't get off the ground. So it's a, a, a series of experts have come out and shown that it's a learned it's a learned ability to get up, just like going up a flight of stairs is learned. With practice, you can easily strengthen your core. When people fall to the ground, they have their own preferred movement pattern to get up. Some people go on all fours and push themselves up. They off that often requires large ranges of motion. It's not that effective. There's a modification of a DNS exercise that I have found unbelievably helpful for preventing long lies. And you practice this, and after a couple of weeks to months, and they're saying now this is becoming such a problem, uh, when you go to a doctor's office, they should evaluate how you get off the ground, and then they should prescribe these interventions based on how long it takes you to get off the ground. So with this exercise, once you get it down, you can get off the ground very quickly. So Carrie, you're gonna do this exercise. And again, it's a modification of the DNS exercise. The top hand's gonna either make a fist or palm down, just like that. This hand is here. Your hips are flexed around 70 or 80 degrees. So you're on the ground. This is similar to a lot of core exercises, side planks. 
in this position, you are now gonna raise your hips up off the ground and not too high, and now you're gonna raise this hip up off the ground. Now in this position, you're gonna bring this knee back and forth, and you're gonna do that 10 times. While that's happening, the core muscles down here are firing, pelvic floor muscles are firing. Lindsay Muma is a chiropractor in North Carolina. She does a lot of work with pelvic floor exercises. This is one of her exercises to strengthen the pelvic floor. Pelvic floor weakness correlates with falls. Once you've done 10, you've probably done more than 10 already. You're gonna bring this knee towards the right hand and that initiates a roll. So come out of that for a second. I want you to do that a little bit quicker. So when you bring, when you bring that right knee towards the hand, it initiates a rollover response that's very natural. You see that? That with a little bit of practice, and then, then switch to the other side and repeat it. Uh, an incredibly easy exercise to do. Once you get it down, if you fall and nothing's broken, you will be able to get up really quickly. You just have to strengthen your core. There's usually one link in there that's weak, either the external oblique, the transverse abdominis, the hip abductor. By doing this exercise, you strengthen all the weak links in that chain. Really easy to do and markedly decreases your chance of being long line. More importantly, it just strengthens your core. So it's a great overall exercise. The next test is the 10 second balance test. To do this test, you stand on one foot, you can touch the opposite leg behind your leg. You keep your eyes open, you're barefoot, and you see if you can balance 10 seconds with your eyes open. You get, yeah, did you, did you just do that? You get three tries. Yeah, you get three tries. You, you, that's just because the camera was on, I'm sure. Yes, so, and one, 1,000, two, 1,000, three, 1,000, four, 1,000, five, 1,000, six, 1,000, seven, 1,000, eight, 1,000, nine, 1,000, 10, 1,000. Perfect, so you pass that test. You could go on for a long time with that. This is an unusual test. It seems simple, it is simple for most people, but, Someone showed that if you're unable to balance for after three tries, you have an 84% higher risk of all-cause mortality, even when adjusting for other factors such as heart disease, high blood pressure, and obesity. The next test, we're, the next intervention we're going to do is called the McHugh Protocol. It was a paper published in the American Journal of Sports Medicine years ago. An orthopedic surgeon had to rehab high-risk uh, football players, and they had previously sprained their ankle. They were overweight. Both of those factors have like a 90% recurrence of ankle sprain. So Carrie's already started doing this protocol. You just stand on one foot. I had that foam pad specially designed to match the McHugh protocol in the study, but I softened it a little bit so your foot moves faster. To do this test, to do this intervention, you just stand on one leg. The shoulder on the side you're standing on has to be near a wall in case you fall laterally. If you fall medially, if you start to fall inwardly, your foot's there but I don't want you falling to the side. So always have the leg that's being exercised near a wall. You have to, in the, in the McHugh protocol in the paper, they held it for five minutes and they did one leg then the other, time consuming, 10 minutes. It decreased injury rates almost 80% in subsequent seasons. Nothing has altered injury rates since. I normally, like that, I normally give this protocol to high level athletes, but I've noticed that anyone over the age of 50, and remember that data that we had talked about, you lose strength at a certain rate, you lose flexibility at a certain rate, you lose balance at a much, much greater rate. And that study that I was talking about before, 1,700 people who could not do that balance test for 10 seconds, the mort mortality rate was astronomical in the people who failed that test. And it was a better predictor of, of death than high blood pressure, obesity, and um, hypertension, uh, high cholesterol. And the inability to do this can be fixed with this protocol. You do three minutes on each leg and then turn the other direction. I tell people when they're doing this, you're gonna get sore in your hip abductor because your hip works with your ankle to help you balance. 
In fact, your gluteus medius is a very important stabilizing muscle. It's called a proprioceptive muscle that tells you where you are in space. It has a lot of spindles in it, which are sensory organs that tell you its length and its velocity of movement. So if you start to tighten there, just step off of it. Three minutes is a long time. It doesn't seem like it. This, everybody thinks this is going to be an easy protocol. It's one of the harder ones. And if you're really, if you've got some time, do the entire McHugh protocol, five minutes on each foot. But your foot, most people are touching the ground a lot more than she is. I, I'm touching every 10 seconds when I do this, but you've been doing this for a while, so your balance is good. If you feel unstable or if you start to cramp in here, put that left foot on the ground or even step off of it and rest for a second. And that's the entire protocol for the McHugh protocol. The next test we're going to go over is the best way to do a sensory evaluation to determine how effective the cutaneous receptors on the bottom of your feet are at telling you how much pressure is being transferred through the bottom of your foot. It doesn't sound like a lot, but when you're standing on the ground, you have tens of thousands of different receptors. There's four different types you're going to see in an image of them now. Some are slow adapting, some are fast adapting. When you put pressure on a specific area of skin while you're walking and running, you're these receptors send a signal into your spinal cord that say, hey, you've shifted your weight too far to the side. So we need you to fire this muscle on the outside to bring us back. Or more importantly, if you start to fall forward, you get receptors right here, and that causes the, you sense that pressure, and you, you, then the toes go down. They have forever attempted to create textured insoles that stimulate these. And the main problem is that by the time you turn 50, it takes 20% more pressure to stimulate these um, cutaneous receptors. By the time you're 80, it takes 75% more pressure. Just like your hearing goes, your vision goes, these receptors are very, they decrease in number and they require more force to stimulate. And for the longest time, people thought they could prevent falls by putting in textured insoles and they got mediocre results. And part of the reason was they put like large elevations, sometimes they use like hose-like elevations, sometimes they use pyramids. They stimulated the entire foot. And what someone showed, they used a special technique called microneurography. They showed that most of the receptors are located along here. And if you stimulate these receptors, they make your toes stronger, they make the peroneal muscles on the outside bring you back to center. But if you inadvertently stimulate these receptors, which sometimes art supports can do, or textured insoles that hit here, they can have a negative effect in that they can produce inhibition of the muscles. And every neurologist, I'm gonna put up a graph of where the four text, where the four cutaneous receptors were. Again, it followed this pattern here. Every neurologist expected that response because there is something called the Babinski sign in medicine. And when you rub a sharp object along the bottom of a foot like this, it causes the toes to reflexively push down. You've stimulated the receptors. If you do the same thing on the inside of the foot, it wouldn't have that response. So they want to figure out which, how can you tell how sensitive, how well-functioning the receptors on the bottom of your feet are. And oddly enough, if you see a, a neurologist, they'll rub a Wartenberg pinwheel over the bottom of the foot. It always feels the same. You can have a nerve that's mostly almost cut in half, and you're still going to be able to feel the Wartenberg pinwheel. The other test they do, if you see a, a neurologist, is they'll take a 128 cycle per second tuning fork, and if someone has impaired sensation here, they won't feel this. I used to use the 128. It was, it was almost worthless. And then a series of papers came out that showed that when people have spinal stenosis or any nerve injury, the first sensation they lose is the ability to feel a 256 cycle per second tuning fork. To the cutaneous receptors, are extremely sensitive to vibration at 256. And if you have good functioning cutaneous receptors, if you take a 256 cycle turn, tuning fork and you put it on the foot, you feel the vibration from that. Yes. And I'll have them raise their hand. Uh, you can feel that if your receptors are working. It's shocking, but a lot of people who think that they've got good sensation cannot feel 256. So. Uh, in order to do this test, you do three tries. Sometimes you tap it on your knee, it's vibrating now. I don't tell them. I hold it like this and I've turned it off. And I say, do you feel pressure from the tuning fork or vibration? Pressure. So 
So when the tuning fork is off, all they'll feel is the pressure. And I do it again. Do you feel pressure or vibration? Vibration. So she passed that. If they um, miss two out of three of these, they fail this test and they have impaired sensation. So because that research came out showing that the lateral side of the foot is coated with cutaneous receptors, I made these odd little textured, they're not even insoles, they just go on your insole, inexpensive, have elevations that get gradually larger as you go to the side. So these ones right here will be placed along the side of the foot. My main goal with this is that you have slow and fast adapting cutaneous receptors. And any insole that you put that is in constant contact with the bottom of the foot, your cutaneous receptors will say, hey, I sense that you're there and I'm just gonna ignore you. So what I did with this is when you put them on someone's insole, heel stick back that comes off the end of it, you put it in the midfoot, so just like this, edge there, the edge there hits the edge of the insole, and then you push it down. And when you do, the entire foot most of the time is on these spots that you feel when you roll. But if you go near your anterior fall envelope, because I, I arched it like this, it will lift up in your shoe. And if you go into that wrong spot right there, you feel it lift. Even, remember, it took 75% more pressure. This puts way more than 75% more pressure. So even if you have impaired sensation, which a lot of people have after ankle sprains, a lot of people have discs in their low back if they've ever had sciatica, this will stimulate those receptors. It's like a hearing aid for your cutaneous receptors. So you just put that in the bottom of your shoe. And then I tell people, and if you have peripheral neuropathy, this works really well too. I tell people to put this on and then I recheck their 10 second balance. You will notice it and they will notice that they have improved balance. If you put this on someone who was unable to feel that 256 cycle per second tuning fork, they can balance better almost immediately. The negative side is this only works while it's in your shoe. These tend to last around six months and it's a really safe and easy way. It's a little uncomfortable for the first day or two, but then after that, you don't even notice it. Again, because you only notice it when you shift back. This test is called the near tandem stand test. And to do this test, you're going to take one foot, you're going to put it in front of the other so that it is one inch forward. And I'm just going to hold on here. One inch forward and then one inch to the side of the back foot. So move it over, move that right foot to the right just a little bit. And Oops. there you go. This test is harder than it looks, so I hold on to the person when they do it or do it next to a wall. And this test is simple. In that position, you have impaired um, or very narrow margin to have a lateral fall because your feet are together. When your feet are far apart, you're not going to fall laterally. But here, you're balanced like on a tightrope. So in order to do this test, you have the person put their arms out for balance, and you set a timer. When they close their eyes, close your eyes, they've got to go 10 seconds without moving a foot or losing balance. I, you have to stand near them because this test is harder than it looks. A significant percent of the people can't do this, and you just made it 10 seconds. This test is in this protocol because failure of this predicts lateral falls. It means that your hip abductors and legs aren't working together. So do all those hip exercises we talked about. If you fail this test, put those balance buttons on, um, and address any other factor associated with falling. So this is a great exercise for increasing stability in the transverse plane. You can hold on to the wall for balance when you first start doing this, but you have an anchor, you have a TheraBand anchored against the leg of a table, and what you do, or anything stable, you will just go back and forth. This was originally developed to treat um, ankle sprains in high-level athletes, so right now the right foot is bearing weight and it's being twisted and spun by the resistance through the left ankle. So you're just going to go back and forth. And then as you get better at this, see if you could do a few without touching. So hold, there you go, back and forward. And now as she's doing this, she's not touching the ground. It takes a little practice. At first you just touch in the front and back, but as you get better, and as you get better, you don't need to hold on to the wall. You can just do it like this. Now you will turn 90 degrees 
And now you're going to take care. You're going to take the left leg and put it behind you and cross over. And again, you usually hold on to the wall for balance. And as you get better with this one too, you can do it without touching the front or the back. The next test we're going to run through is a flexibility test. It is designed to evaluate your degree of ankle dorsiflexion. Ankle dorsiflexion is upward motion at the ankle. And if it's tight, you're going to have a shortened stride length. And if it's really tight, you won't be able to accommodate discrepancies in terrain. A study out of University of Queensland, 372 women, older women, those who had two or more, more falls had eight degrees less motion in the ankle. And several studies have correlated calf stiffness with falls. Really easy to test. You're just going to go into a forward lunge position, hold on to a wall for balance, because again, this can be a little difficult. And then you're just going to lunge as far forward as you can, keeping that back heel on the ground. You're going to set your iPhone to uh, utilities and then level, and a level just pops up. It couldn't be easier. You just hold this against the leg. So this is 36 degrees, 37 degrees. People who do not get 34 degrees are more likely to have falls. And the treatment for that is prolonged static stretching. Prior studies show that stretching only produces short-term length gains, but several high-quality studies have shown that when you hold a stretch for 30 seconds or even 60 seconds, that if you hold it long enough, the muscle not just lengthens, the tendon gets stronger, the muscle gets stronger. Apparently, when you do a stretch for long periods of time, you squeeze blood out of the muscle because there's so much tension. That stimulates the production of growth hormone, which makes the muscle thicker and stronger. And some great research using ultrasonography showed that it actually adds muscle fibers, they're called sarcomeres, to the end of the muscle so it physically gets longer. The best way to restore motion when there's limited ankle dorsiflexion is with prolonged static stretching. And let me have you just get on the, any slam or the toe pro is fine. You are, it should be at least a 10 degree decline as you lean forward. You can stretch both legs at the same time. If you do a little bit of a toe-in stretch when you do this, you can target the medial gastroc so your heel stays on the ground for this. This is a stretch. And you just lean forward until you feel mild to moderate tension in through here. The, the stretches should be to the point that you really feel it pulling. And one study out of Iran showed that four 60-second stretches significantly improved side-to-side -side balance, which could prevent lateral falls. And Anthony Kay, an amazing researcher from the United Kingdom, has done several studies showing that long-term static stretches have favorable outcomes for actually changing muscle architecture. A meta-analysis was just published that I'll put up where they looked at all the studies done on short duration stretch, long duration stretch. Long duration stretch actually gets such a change in the muscle because it squeezes blood out of the muscle. That in turn releases, increases the release of growth hormone, which accelerates muscle remodeling. And several studies using ultrasonography show that you actually build muscle fibers on the end of the stretched muscle, so it physically changes the muscle. Short-term stretches lengthen the muscles, but then it snaps back. If you hold a stretch for 30, 45, even 90 seconds, one study where they did um, high-level volleyball players, they had them stretch their calves with 90-second stretches, 12 to 15 minutes a day. They had over 20% increases in jump height, market improvements in muscle volume, and the muscles got longer. I just have people do four 30 second stretches, really easy. Do this in between your exercise protocols. Have this lying around, and when you're doing different sets and reps, just throw in a 30 second stretch or a 40 second stretch. If you do the stretch with your knee bent, you target the soleus muscle in through here, and I'll put up a series of stretches so you can see them. And they're really effective for managing plantar fasciitis and improving overall performance and balance, especially medial lateral balance. The next measurement we're going to take, it's not just limited upward motion that causes injuries, it's limited inversion and eversion. These are the two motions. Your rear foot tilts like this. When, you're, when you step on discrepancies in terrain like a cobblestone, your foot everts rapidly to accommodate it so you don't have to move your knee. If you have limited eversion or limited inversion, if you do step on an uneven surface, you have to move your knee, which requires a large range of motion very fast, and there's a strong correlation with falls with people with limited inversion and eversion. This test, it could be done in a doctor's office in two seconds. 
Um, but you can also do it at home. You bisect the back of the heel with a pen. So let me have you just take a close up of this. I just come along the top, I look at the bisection of the heel, you form a, a rhomboid like that, and you make a little dot here, you make a little dot here, and then you just connect those dots. Because you're just going to check the change in from the start to the finish, you could use like a soft pen, you could use anything that, um, a felt pen, that'll leave a little bit of a mark. So this side you can see a nice little mark. So let me have you, after you've marked that spot, and just a couple of dots, just so you can see the lines, you're going to stand up now please. You're going to use that same iPhone that you used before. And you're going to stand right there, please. And this one, your feet are like a foot apart. So let me have you stand just like this. So move your feet with it. So your, that foot's going to go like that. Perfect. And with this test, you see where the, this line is now? You are going to have the person flatten their feet. So turn your knees in, flatten your feet as much as you can, right? So I then take the little goniometer and I just tilt it like this, right? So it's five degrees. Now you're going to raise your arches and you're going to shift out as much as you can. So I'm just going to make this line parallel to that line. Do you see that? So that is in eight degrees. You add those two numbers together, you need 25 degrees. You fail that test because she has a limited range of motion. She's got a neutral to high arch and people with high arches tend to have limited motion. Not a big deal because you can get this, you can restore this motion or maintain it. You just don't want it to worsen. Women lose this range at a quicker rate than men. And there's a protocol called the two to one ankle rock board that if you do not have 25 degrees of motion between inversion and eversion, you've got to do the rock board. And I'm going to show you how to do that now. So if someone has limited inversion or eversion, or they just want to make their ankle strong, this is a very common treatment intervention after ankle sprains. There's a two to one rock board. Most rock boards tilt 16 degrees in each direction. And since your foot only tilts 10 degrees one way and 20 degrees the other way, that's it's too much one way, not enough another. I custom made a rock board that tilts nine degrees in one direction to, for eversion and, and 18 degrees the other direction. So to do it, there's a, abrasive edge on this, your arch goes on this, your foot goes on this with your arch pointing towards this side. So your right foot will be like that with the arch going in, your left foot will be like that with the arch going in. So I know that sounds complicated, but it really isn't. So you put this next to a wall and Carrie's going to run through it. You do this, you have to do this with your shoes on. I deliberately made this out of rubber because most rock boards that are plastic, you can kind of just shift your hips and make them move and you don't move your ankles. Because it's rubber, it bends, and you have to fight the bend. If you do it barefooted, you bend the sides like this, and it's not as effective. So shoes on, you stabilize it with your left foot, just hold it still, as your right foot finds that center balance point. If you go too far over to the side, you won't be able to come back in one direction, or if you go too far this way. So right in the center, there's a little ball under there, and if you get it right, let me have you start doing it, and just move that, get that foot off the ground. If you have the right spot, it rolls equally. If she would get pinned over here, if her foot was too far over here, she'd just have to restart and just get on this top of the ball. After you've done it a few times, really easy to feel, super easy to do. Because it's the right foot and the right foot rolls like this during push-off, you're going to do 60 counterclockwise rotations on the right foot, then you're going to spin and do 60 counterclockwise rotations on the left foot. Remember when you spin it around, you have your arch pointing towards the, the other side, so you have to rotate the whole thing. And on this side, you're gonna go clockwise on the left side. That duplicates, have that inward roll towards your big toe that happens when you're walking and running. And really easy to do, you just do 60 repetitions. If you have the strength, you can do two sets of 60 repetitions. As you get stronger, there's an advanced protocol. Have I ever showed you the advanced protocol? Mm -hmm. The advanced protocol, and again, here is the center balance point right there, and it's marked on this right here. For the advanced protocol, and now I'll do it, and I'll just have you do it. I'll just hold it still. I pull it farther away from the wall like this because I want more resistance. I hold it for balance. I put the center of my forefoot over it so my, the center of my forefoot's on the wall, my heel isn't touching. Then using the wall for resistance, I'll just do one set of 30 going like this. This is extremely difficult, and it, I, I give this to high-level sprinters and other agility athletes. 
So 30 is going to be enough. The farther you go away from the wall, the more resistance. You're only your forefoot is contacting it. So let me have you. I'll get a little closer. Give that a try. Stabilize with the left foot. Forefoot over the center. Hold on to the wall for balance. And yeah, move your foot a little to the right. You can tell. Just try it and see where it feels. Right, exactly. And you're going to go. There you go. You're a quick learner. So, and if this was a little farther away from the wall, it'd be even harder. So just 30 repetitions like that. This fires the peroneal muscles. This fires a bunch of different muscles in the calf. And look at the range that it's putting her foot through. She had very limited inversion, eversion. This mobilizes all those joints through a full range of motion. So the best way to increase rotation is with a technique developed by a researcher from the United Kingdom, Anthony Kay. I reference him a lot. He did a study on Achilles injuries and he wanted to figure out the best way to lengthen muscles. There's all these different techniques. And he showed that if you tense a muscle in a midline position, so with the ankle would be 90 degrees, with moderate pressure for five seconds, then you relaxed and stretched for 10 seconds and then went back to the start and did it again, five and 10. You did that four times, it just takes a minute. You've got marked improvements in flexibility, up to 20% increases. So I apply it to all joints, in this case, the neck. So to do it in the head, you'll put your hand against your cheek, so right hand against right cheek. Now with moderate pressure, you're going to turn your head to the right in your hand, and you should feel about 5 or 10 pound, pounds of pressure in your hand. Hold that for 5 seconds. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Then you remove your hand, and then turn your head as far as it will comfortably go like that. Hold that for 10 seconds. Then you go back to the start. And you're going to do the same thing now. Push to the right, five seconds. One, two, three, four, five. Then relax. Turn your head to the right as far as you can. Each time they do it, they go farther and farther. She wasn't that limited, but if someone starts at 60, by the time they finish it, they're at 90 degrees. It's really amazing. You just have to do this a couple of times a day. Really easy to do. Do both directions. If you're limited in one direction, just do that side. Then to increase motion in your thoracic spine, there's different ways of doing it. My favorite is just to grab the back edge of the table of the chair and hold that stretch. Twist as far as you can. Hold that stretch for 30 seconds. And then do the same thing going the other direction. Really easy to do. Great ways to increase motion in the spine. I did not incorporate this in the, the standard protocol because you can just do this throughout the day. I'll often have people do the whole relax stretch when they're in the shower or when they get up in the morning. And again, look for asymmetry and fix that asymmetry. Given the fact that the only thing between ourselves and the ground when we fall is our feet, it's amazing how little research has been done evaluating the effect of foot architecture on falls. In 2008-2017, the Institute for Aging in Boston teamed up with Australian researchers and came up with a cohort from the Framingham Heart Study. They took over 1,300 people and evaluated fall risk based on foot architecture, and they used high-tech machines to measure arch height. People with low arches were twice as likely to fall as people with neutral and high arches. My favorite way to measure this is, let me have you step off of that, is with a device called medial drift or the medial malleolus. Really easy to do. The farther your foot rolls this way, the more you stretch ligaments, making them mechanically inefficient, greatly increasing the risk of a fall. So I had a friend, Cunningham Engineering, just, in, in, just north of Boston, make this beautiful little device for me, dovetailed hinges, incredibly accurate, and to use it, you set it at zero, and you have the person put both feet four inches apart, just like that, separate your feet a little bit more. That is perfect, so five or six inches apart, there's a little bone there called the talus, the talonavicular joint. If the talus sits here and it bulges this way, I can feel the head of it here, and it sits in a socket called the navicular. And I'll get you a skeleton just so you can see what I'm talking about, because it's really easy to measure this, and once you've felt this a couple of times, it's easy to measure. 
So when you look at a foot, this bone here, the talus comes out of socket and rolls this way. And when it does, it stretches everything. But when it moves that way, it takes this bone, the malleolus with it. So measuring arch height here isn't good because muscles are thick and you get a false sense of arch height. Um, just measuring the, the amount this bone drops, it doesn't work because it, it varies so much from people to people. So I made this device. They studied it at Shenandoah University and has excellent integrated reliability over 0.85. So I just put the talonavicular joint in a midline position, raise your arches by shifting to the outside, slowly come down, start like that, right there. So hold your feet right like that. So right now those two bones are maximally congruent. I can feel them. I just put this device here. I slide the head away and I say, now relax both feet completely. Let your feet roll in. And you see how she's not rolling in? She only rolled in, she rolled in five millimeters. So. Zero to five is neutral to high arch, which fits with that measurement. She was just on the, the cuff of being high arch. Uh, five to 10 is neutral arch. Anything over 10 millimeters is low arch. I have had people roll in 22 or 24 degrees. They have feet like pancakes. Those people are prone to falling. They put too much pressure here. They're prone to getting bunions. Um, and when you have that, there's different ways of fixing it. Some people, We'll go right away to orthotics, and some great research has shown that a pronated foot is no more likely to be problematic than a neutral high arch foot if it's strong. So whenever someone has a pronated foot, more often than not, they're weak. And that's why the research on low arches has been tough, because if you are low arched and you're strong, you're going to be fine. So I measure toe strength with that dynamometer. And if they're fine, I leave them alone. I don't care how low their arches are. If they have good calf flexibility and if they're strong, if they're weak, I put them on the toe pro or any other foot strengthening device. And then if they are symptomatic, because Hilton Men's from Australia showed that a symptomatic foot is correlated with higher fall risks, I use peel and stick varus post to shift their weight away from their foot. And I'm gonna show you what that is in a second. So instead of using an orthotic, and I'm hesitant to use an orthotic in people with really low arches because several studies have shown that one 12-week study where they used ultrasonography to measure muscle volume, there was seven and then prescribed orthotics. Over that 12-week period, the abductor hallucis muscle, the big muscle of the arch, weakened 17% and the flexor digitorum brevis, the main muscle that's in the center of the arch, goes to the lesser toes, weakened 11%. Those are huge numbers. And... I am always worried, especially with falls, the last thing you want to do is weaken someone's foot. So if someone's an overpronator, you want to stop them from rolling inward. So I have these manufactured. They're called peel and stick virus posts. Orthotics are expensive. They take a long time to get used to. I love them. I mean, in most situations, they last for years. And if you know what you're doing with orthotics, you can get amazing outcomes. But this is just a simple alternative to that. I'll just, and let me have you take a little shot over the top of this. I'll just have them... Give me their insole, and I'll just take the insole, I'll mark it a little bit, and then I'm gonna take the other varus post here, and it has a peel and stick back on it, so I just slightly remove it. It just goes like this. So this, because it's angled like that, it's gonna support the inner forefoot and stop them from rolling in, but it's not gonna support the arch in any way, so I know where to place it. I just put it here. These go on in seconds. And I just mark it so I know where to put it. I take that peel and stick back off. This glue is crazy strong. So once it's on, it's on. So I line it up. I just drop it down. Same thing on the rear foot. I line it up. Drop it down. Several studies, and I'll put them up, show that when you do this, now it's, it's candid. The foot won't roll in as far. It decreases tibial rotation, leg rotation. Leg rotation has been correlated with a lot of different injuries from patellar tendinopathy to valgus collapse of the knee. Um, and more importantly, it decelerates the velocity and range of motion. And it also can help improve the proprioception because it supports that inner side of the foot. It takes a few seconds to go on. They tend to last about two years before you have to break them down. So put them on a fresh pair of insoles if you have them and they decelerate velocity, they decrease stress on the knee, and they are great with overpronators, and they're way less expensive than an orthotic.
So it turns out that um, as far as foot architecture goes, it's not just low arches that correlate with falls. The presence of bunions and hammer toes deformity, hammer toe deformity also does. And you can tell if someone has a bunion. Carrie has a small little bunion here, but she's got pretty good alignment of the gray toe. If you draw a line through the first metatarsal and then the gray toe, it's got to be more than a 15 degree angle, really more than a 20 degree angle for the bunion to affect balance. The reason bunions affect balance is as that toe goes in, instead of the muscles that go to the toe flexor hallux as long as being able to pull down, they actually, if it tilts over far enough, it creates a force that pulls it back this way, like pulling on the reins of a horse where they just pull on one side. So when someone does have a, a bunion in, in that study, they reviewed over 140 studies in 2018 and found that people with bunions are 1.9 times more likely to fall and people with hammer toes deformity are 1.7 times more likely to fall. If they have a bunion, a bunion by itself isn't going to cause a fall unless it's also weak. So I have people use toe separators to improve the alignment. Remember, if the toe is over here more and they fire, and you can see it in people with large bunions, when you say push down into the ground, when they push down, the bunion actually worsens. So I like to, and actually do a little try, push your big toe down in the ground. And it will rotate like this, but when the toe lines up with the metatarsal, and people who wear tight, so, so, tight fitting shoes can have problems, when it lines up with the metatarsal and you push down, all that force goes straight down. But if it's bent, it creates a retrograde force that pulls the toe in this way and worsens it. So look at the angle, more than 20 degrees, check toe strength and strengthen. And then if that is more than 20 degrees, use a toe separator. And I'm going to show you how to use my favorite. If you've got, some people have 30, I've seen people with 45 and 50 degree angles and they have to custom make a toe separator out of a material called Pettiplast, which I'm going to run you through right now. So to make a custom toe, toe separator, which comes in really handy with large bunions, this is a material called Pettiplast. They charge way too much for it, but if you've got large bunions, it's worth getting. You will, it's just a silicone material. You just take out a, an amount the size of the like the top half of your thumb and then roll it into a ball right it's, it's like silly putty and then you put it in between the big toe and second toe and let me have you take an angle from up here you see how it forms an hourglass like that it gets in there and then you squeeze it you can make it whatever shape you want and then it really stays there it, it forms into that position over time uh, so I just check the amount. I like that amount that I have. It fit in through there well. So now that I know I've got the right amount, I go back and I make it into like a long egg. And then I tell people, make believe it's a hot dog and you're putting ketchup, although who would put ketchup on a hot dog? And you just go like that. And that's the hardener. It's a silicone hardener. And you then layer it in. It's a waxy material. It's going to get on your fingers. Just mix it in completely. And again, it's a hardener. So if it doesn't mix in thoroughly, it's not going to set. It normally sets in about five minutes, but I like mushing it through. If I'm in a rush and I've, I've got a lot of hardener, I'll add a little extra hardener so it sets fast. If I've done a lot of these, so I don't worry about the time. If you haven't done them before, you can just put like two thirds of the length of the material on it. It'll give you a little more set time, but then it can take too much time to get it going. But the, as you can see, I'm even gonna take the hardener that's on my finger, I'm gonna take that off. So when you don't see little red stripes of the hardener in there, it's done. So then you just roll it in a ball and you've got like two or three minutes. Again, I like making like a long egg. I put it in between the, the big toe and the second and third toe, midline, so it kind of looks like a toe there. And then I just squeeze the tops like this and push it down and it forms between all the spaces. And then I line that toe up. I want the first metatarsal to line up with the big toe. So I just hold it there. So that's a good position. I'm just gonna hold it here for around a minute or two. And then after a minute or two, it starts to set. And then I pull it out and then I just let it set on the side for another 15 minutes. So. So about a minute and a half, two minutes have passed. So I just get that big toe out and that's the toe separator. Now it's, it's starting to harden, but it's not really hard. So I just put it aside somewhere and let it sit for another 10 to 15 minutes. 
because sometimes people will have their favorite um, toe separators when they do this. I'll sometimes take a pen and then um, while it's soft, I'll just, because people get confused, I'll put right on the top there so they can see it. And then if, if some people will have large toe separators, and I recommend people make large ones that they sleep with a study out of Thailand so that sleeping with toe separators on decreased bunion height size over time. So I'll have them make a small one to do their exercises on, and then a larger one that they just wear as a night appliance while they sleep. And some nice research shows that decreases the overall size. So she's gonna know it's for the right side because I marked it, not necessary, because if you can tell by the feel, you let it sit hardened for 20 minutes. And remember, Carrie does not have them, but people with hammer toes are 1.7 times more likely to have a fall. And it's because when you have hammer toes, toe, toes curl so much that they only generate pressure at the tips. And as they curl, the flexor digitorum longus muscle, which goes to these to the toes, it gets stretched and there's a fat pad that attaches to it and it gets displaced forward. So you have less cushioning under the center of your forefoot. When people have really hammered toes, they're, they often report pain in their central forefoot because the protective fat pad gets displaced. So what you wanna do is increase the ability of the toes to bear weight when they're hammered. And there's something called a hammer toe buttress pad. It just has a ring. It goes on the third toe like this. And then you just tighten it with a little pull through. And then you can cut this little extra piece off. When they're walking, push down into my fingers, it gives a broader area, it distributes pressure, and I'll put a picture up. It distributes pressure over the entire toe, not just the tip of the toe, so they have an improved ability to generate force beneath their toes. People with hammer toes, and I'll go over this right now, tend to be extremely weak in their toe flexors, and they often can't do something as aggressive as the toe pro, because that's difficult to do. So they've gone so long without firing them they cannot even get them to fire. And a great study, and this is important, they measured strength by making a little sling that went here and they had people push down one toe at a time and then they went the other way and lifted up. People with weak toes where they couldn't push down were markedly more likely to get hammer toes. So when you're young, you should strengthen the muscles that push down. When you're young, you can do the toe pro. When you're older, um, I'm gonna show you a great exercise for doing that. Favorite way to strengthen hammer toes that are really weak, and you're going to know they're weak because you're going to do the toe dynamometer test, is to take a TheraBand because they cannot do the standard toe pro exercise. You take their entire foot and put it on top of a, a flat TheraBand or an elastic band, and then you're going to have them hold it in their hand by their knee, just like that, with enough tension so that it lifts the toes. Now push down, then relax. Push down, relax and you adjust the tension by how much you pull up at the knee. So if it's easy, you just pull up a little bit more, raise your toes up and let them down. Don't worry if the big toe follows it. You wanna see that you basically wanna to learn to activate these muscles. Some people will be unable to fire like their second toe if it's hammered at all, and you can put this just under the second toe if that's the case. So I have people do a lot of these, four sets of 25 with very light resistance, this just wakes the muscle up and teaches you where it is. Once you find it and can recruit it, then you can do more aggressive exercises on the toe pro.